This table looks at drug development and testing. It really gives us an opportunity to talk about clinical trials. It's possible that you can get a question on your exam related to clinical trials. Mostly you need to pay attention to the design of the trial and the purpose of the trial. Before we put a drug into clinical trials, we do preclinical trials on animal models. And sometimes those studies can last for a number of years. But focus most of your time on the four phases of clinical trials. When I think about phase one testing, first of all, phase one is done in healthy volunteers. People will volunteer, occasionally we will pay these folks, but they will volunteer to be a part of phase one trials. Notice since it's healthy volunteers, there's no way that you're testing for efficacy at this point. The only thing that you can test in these healthy volunteers is safety in dosage. To say it another way, the purpose of phase one is to find a safe dosage to move on into phase two, but we're doing that in healthy patients. We're doing that in healthy people. Phase two trials typically are the first time that we're gonna test the drug out in patients. The numbers go up. Now we're talking about hundreds of folks involved in a phase two trial. Since we're dealing with patients, we can evaluate effectiveness. Phase two typically is the first time we test for efficacy. How about this question? What phase of clinical trials do most drugs fail? The answer is phase two. Most drugs that enter clinical trials will fail in phase two. In fact, if they make it through phase two, we're gonna do an even more extensive study on those drugs, but if they fail in phase two, typically that is the end of that drug. We get through phase two, we found that the drug was effective. Now we do a more extensive phase three trial, typically with thousands of patients. The purpose of phase three is to confirm the effectiveness in a larger patient population and also to look for common side effects. Keep in mind, it has to be common side effects because you're only talking about a couple of thousand patients. You're never going to see the rare side effects occur with such a small patient population. When the drug makes it through a phase three trial, it undergoes a review by the FDA. If it's approved by the FDA, it then goes into phase four trials, what's called a post-marketing surveillance. This happens after the drug has been approved to go out on the market and now patients are taking this drug and physicians are prescribing it. In fact, this is an opportunity for the average physician to possibly get involved in clinical trials. They can volunteer to be a part of collecting data in phase four. Importantly, the purpose of phase four trials can determine the common side effects, really confirming some of those that we might have seen in phase three, but also to discover rare side effects. This is that time when side effects that occur in let's say one in 10,000 or one in 100,000 patients are discovered because this is the only time that we're getting a large enough sample size to detect those rare side effects. It's why some people advocate that you should wait at least three to five years after a drug goes out onto the market before you begin prescribing it to your patients. That's gonna be a hard rule to follow, by the way. A lot of pressure on you by your patients to prescribe these new medications. But why would you wait three to five years to start prescribing a drug? Clearly, it's because we don't have enough data about rare side effects. And some of you might remember the lesson learned from years back with the COX-2 inhibitors. Where as popular as they were when they first hit the market, while we were doing our phase four trials, we discovered some rare side effects that those drugs may cause, rare side effects like death. We have a table on teratogenicity. It's basically how the FDA classifies drugs and their pregnancy categories and their pregnancy risk. We have five different categories that we're going to use, A, B, C, D, and X. Of course, this is all based on data that we've collected either in animals or in humans, and hopefully both. When you think about a drug, and we call it category A, those drugs are considered very safe in pregnancy. That's the good news. The bad news is that almost nothing is in category A. You know what's in category A? Folic acid. That's right, you're pregnant, folic acid. We're willing to give you folic acid, pretty much folic acid and water is about what we're willing to give you in pregnancy. Folic acid, very safe in pregnancy. We have drugs that are categorized as B, which are considered safe in pregnancy. But of course, this is where it starts to get scary. Look at C. 
Category C drugs may be safe. If you look at the table, notice how it shows you that there are no studies available in humans. And that's kind of scary. Well, why does a drug get put into category C? I call it the unknown category. If we don't know anything about a drug's teratogenic risk, we tend to put it into category C. If we learn over time that the drug is safe in pregnancy, we might move it up, let's say, to category B. But if we discover that the drug is harmful to the fetus, then we drop it down into D or X. And if you're thinking, how can we have a category where it's unknown, where we don't have the data? Well, how often do you think pregnant women are volunteering for clinical trials? Very, very difficult to collect this data, so it's a slow process over time. Once you get down to category D or category X, those are teratogenic drugs. Those are drugs, we have human studies that show those drugs have caused harm to the fetus. But there is a difference in how category D and category X are viewed in terms of your patient. For example, a category D drug, you might decide to actually continue your pregnant patient on that category D drug only if the benefits of that drug to the patient outweigh the risk to the fetus. An example would be if you don't have any suitable alternatives to treat their condition. But with category X, you immediately discontinue the medication. Don't even think about continuing a patient on a category X type drug. Immediately discontinue. Again, both are harmful to the fetus, and we're going to talk about some examples in the rest of our lectures of drugs that are teratogenic, and if we know the specific teratogenic effects, those all make for very good test questions. Now that we finished chapter two, let's do a few practice questions together. Here's the first one. This is an opportunity for you to pause the video, review the question, think about it, come up with a correct answer, and then we'll discuss. So here we've got four drugs. They produce the same therapeutic effect by the same mechanism, but each has a unique toxicity. We're trying to figure out which drug is likely to have the highest incidence of toxicity. When I look at the data that's presented, I'm looking for information that helps me to determine toxicity risk for the drug. Median effective dose really doesn't tell me that, but TD50 over ED50 actually does, because that's my therapeutic index. And the rule on therapeutic index is the lower the number, the more dangerous the drug. By that rule, that would be choice B. 2.1 is the lowest number that would be the most dangerous drug. That would be the one with the highest incidence of toxicity. But some of you still focused on the other column, median effective dose. And you saw numbers like 0.5 and 1 and 5 and 33. Really what those numbers are probably reflecting is more the potency of the drug. Drug A is more potent than B, and B is more potent than C, which is more potent than D, because it takes smaller amounts of those drugs to produce their effectiveness. So as a result, the first column is really not helpful in answering this question. Don't let it influence your choice of which drug has the highest incidence of toxicity. Here's our second question. Once again, pause the video. We will discuss. So serious, possibly fatal adverse effects of a new drug may first appear only after the drug is approved for marketing by the Food and Drug Administration. The failure to detect these effects is best explained by the use of which of the following in the pre-marketing clinical trials. Remember, the fact that we don't see those side effects ultimately until the drug has gone out on the market is because the clinical trials in phase one and phase two and phase three have used a very, very small number of patients. The only way that you're going to detect rare side effects is when you have a much larger patient population, and that only happens in phase four, the post-marketing surveillance studies that we do. So the correct answer here is E. There were just too few subjects to detect those rare events. Here's our third question. Once again, pause the video, review the question, and we will discuss. Leukotrienes are implicated in asthma, and they act via leukotriene receptors to cause bronchoconstriction. Albuterol, acting through beta-2 receptors, can oppose the actions of leukotrienes by causing bronchodilation. We want to know what term best describes this effect. If you go back earlier and we talked about the different types of antagonism, 
Leukotrienes have their own receptor. Albuterol has its own receptor. 